I'm going to open with um, an excerpt from Psalm 139. It's verses 13 through 18. Lord, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained, ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. <clears throat> How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I have a couple comments to make about that. First of all, the grains of sand. I don't mind going to the beach and trying to count them if anybody wants me to you know, prove that for you. I'm there for you. But seriously, have you ever looked at like a magnified picture of the grains of sand? They are not round. They are jagged edges, which means that they click together. They form with each other so that it's not like ball bearings just, you know, moving all around and slip sliding away kind of thing. They, you know, it allows them to pile up. That's not random. That was purpose with a design, design with a purpose, excuse me. And then going back to the, you know, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Um, you all know that, you know, we've, we've recently got a new grandson and it's been a challenge for Julie and Matt, but some of the things that I've learned from Julie recently in, in her trying to feed them is that, um, you know, mother's milk, the way that women's body were created, there are differences. A daytime milk has more like, almost like a caffeine substance in it that keeps the baby awake during the day. And then nighttime milk, has more melatonin in it so that the babies sleep longer during the day. Um, when babies are nursing and if they have a cold, you know how they're like their nose and their, you know, the skin to skin, their nose and their mouth, a mother's body will detect the, a virus, a cold in the baby and will naturally produce antibodies so that the baby gets over the cold more quickly. Also, just if a mom is exposed to somebody else that has a cold, she will produce antibodies to keep the baby healthier. The, the milk changes as the baby grows. It, your body just kind of knows how old the baby is. It changes the fat content, the carbs, the protein, all that sort of stuff. And studies have shown that babies that nurse um, especially girls, have a 25% lower chance of getting most types of cancer. This is not random. This is not random. God knit us together this way in our mother's wombs, in the secret place. One of my favorite pictures that I have is a picture of my mom and myself, our daughter Joanna, and her twin daughters, the four generations. The babies were about three months old, and they were so preemie, I think they were like between five and six pounds, so they're really tiny. But within those little girls' bodies, already the eggs are there for the fifth generation. Girls are born with all the eggs they're ever gonna make in their lifetime on the day that they are born. They already have them. This is not random. God knits us together in this wonderful, amazing way. And look at all of us here for anything that could have gone wrong and hasn't in our development. God did that for us from day one. Our days are numbered, written in the book. Thank you, Lord. Let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, for the privilege to come before you, to worship you, to praise you, to become more aware of your blessings, and hopefully grateful. Lord, we lift up this service to you. Lord, I pray that you knit together all of the elements of our service, all of the people who are here, and the people who aren't, Lord. Let them know that they are missed. Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, to you, 
to your graciousness, to your blessing, to your provision for us. Lord, pray that we appreciate it, acknowledge it, and pass it on. In Jesus' name, amen. Turning to your uh, Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, that it is light and that it is truth. And it shines on our paths so that we can walk in a way that is pleasing to you and helpful and healthful, healthy to us. So Lord, as we look into your word and read this day, I pray your blessing upon it. Open our hearts to receive it, to receive it deeply, that it might take root and bear fruit, all to the honor and glory of your name, in which we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I'm gonna take three scriptures today all focusing on one thing, even though they're in different places. We're talking about good works today. First scripture is this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is grace, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's verse 10 that is the focus of my thoughts right now for we are God's workmanship we are God's workmanship as a body and we are each individually God's workmanship and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior you can take that to the bank that you have become his workmanship and that word in the Greek workmanship has the concept or the idea of creation in it. It's the same verse that's used in Romans when he says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what was made or what has been made so that people with, are without excuse. So what has been made has been made from that which is not seen. We are God's workmanship. We are being created in a new way. We are new creatures. And the word that I'm talking about here is poiema, the Greek word poiema, poem. That's where we get our English word poem. A creative, beautiful, sonnet, if you will. And we are God's workmanship. We are the thoughts that are in Him expressed in something lovely. You are God's poem. And He is doing a work in you as His poem. From Him 
through us. And it goes on to say that as we are God's workmanship, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Why am I created in Christ Jesus? Why has he taken on the burden of my sin? Why has he given me this sal great salvation that is free? It is by his love and by his grace so that I can do good works. And I have focused on this word, this Greek word, because I think this is a powerful, powerful thing. The Greek word is agathos. And in the essence of the Greek word, the understanding is that this word designates that describes that which originates from God and is empowered by him in their life through faith. So the good works, the works that we're talking about here are things that happen in our lives, opportunities that come to us that originate from God and, are and we become empowered by him to perform those works through faith. This Wednesday night, we had a little, um, a little video. Tim Tebow has a book out called um, This Is The Day. And it's about purposeness, purposefulness in life. And we watched like a eight minute video in which he gives, he describes a, an opportunity he had to minister, to do a good work. He was on a flight and he's sitting there with his headphones on and he's watching a, a video, a movie on, on the screen. And, and all of a sudden he realized there was something going on in the plane around him and he didn't know what it was. He took off the headphones and he started looking around and he realized that behind him there was some activity in one of the seats on the other side of the aisle. And he came to realize that there was a man lying down, an elderly man lying down with some sort of a medical problem. And he just went, Lord, I don't know what to do. I, I feel like I should do something here, but... The, the stewardess came by and said, does anyone know CPR? And another stewardess said, does, is there a doctor on board? Is there a doctor on the flight? Can someone help? And Tim said, I just kept thinking to myself, I, I should do something, but I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't know CPR. What can I do? What can I do? There's nothing I can do. So we put the headphones back on. And he pushed the play button on the video. But he couldn't get rid of the sense inside that he needed to do something. He says, what can I do? And he grabbed a stewardess and he says, is there anything I can do to help? Could I go back and pray with that lady? And the, she said, could you ask if I could go back and pray? And the, the stewardess said, yeah, yeah. And she went ahead and did nothing. And then another stewardess came by and he said to her, could you ask if I could go back and pray with that, those people back there? She went back and she started talking to the lady who was sitting next to the man that was having the medical condition. And Tim said, suddenly she came forward and she's waving me to come back and waving me to come back. Well, he went back and he said to the woman, can I pray with you? And she says, yes, please do. So he prayed with her and he prayed for a miracle and he prayed for the man and he prayed for a healing. And he, he just, he didn't know what to do. Agathos, what originates from God and is empowered by him in their life through faith. He did what he could do in the moment and in the situation. He prayed in faith for that man. And the last thing he remembers while they were on the plane is someone saying, I think we have a pulse. And they took the man off of the plane, the medical people when they arrived, and they took the man off of the plane. And he said to the woman, he says, can I go with you? Can, can I go with you to be with your husband? And the story goes on that he, he took her in his SUV to the place where the husband had been taken. And when they got there, the doctor came out to see them and he said, I'm sorry for your loss. Now that's not the way you'd expect the story to turn out. But he said, do you want me to go back with you to see your husband so you can say your goodbyes? And just the ministry that he experienced with that woman, the love and the compassion, the Christ-likeness that was there with him, that is what he had to give in that moment. It was a powerful little testimony. 
We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now think about the reality of that concept that God called you into his kingdom by his grace, by his love, and by his mercy. And he has a, an agenda for you. He has an agenda for me. Are we ready for that? Do we look for that opportunity? The Holy Spirit is at work in the world, and we need to keep in step with God's Spirit. We need to keep ourselves in step from God, with God's Spirit. That's from Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Paul goes on, and that comes on the tail end of talking about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And so the second verse I want us to look at comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. If you'd like to turn there. There were um, some issues in the church that Timothy was ministering in, and Paul was talking about some people in the church that were causing difficulties. They were, they were changing the, uh, some doctrines about Jesus and uh, about, the, uh, about the resurrection. And there were people who were caught up in some junk, worldly junk. And he gives Timothy this illustration. Chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, he says, In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. By the way, that's the scripture that Refiner's Fire is based on. Useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. And what he was talking about is there were, you got your fine china and you got your best silverware. And when the special guests come, you get it out. That's the honorable stuff. But you also got the trash can in the kitchen and it's got all those fruit flies in it. And you got, you got instruments, vessels that are useful for a purpose, but they're kind of filthy. And they had those kind of vessels in the house. You didn't use a gold chalice to wash the dishes with or, you know, take out the dish soap, the dirty dish water in to take the trash out in a, in a beautiful silver bowl. No, you used a clay thing and you used a wooden thing to do the dirty, grungy job. But Paul, in this illustration, the Lord wants, the Lord wants his, wants holy people doing his work. He wants set aside people doing his work. He wants people who have recognized what's inside of them and have worked to have it cleaned out, to take that filthy receptacle, that filthy trash can, if you will, and to clean it out and make it more capable of a noble purpose. People, these are, these are some thoughts from David Jeremiah I'd like to read in his comment on that verse. He says, the Lord wants holy people doing his work, people who are cleansed from wrong conduct, wrong doctrine, and wrong motive. Paul's illustration tells us that currently dishonorable vessels or servants may become vessels of honor who are specially prepared and purposed by God, if only they will purge themselves of wrong influences and motives. It's great to think that God can take a sinful person and use them 
for something miraculous and wonderful in ministry. But there are times when we're not quite ready for that opportunity. There are times when we are so preoccupied with worldly things and ourselves, and even sin indulgence, if you will, that we're just not quite ready for what the Lord might have us to be able to do. We might not be ready for those works that God had prepared in us, uh, prepared for us in advance to do. A man must examine himself and say, Lord, purify my heart. Keep in step with the Spirit. So it's important to realize that God wants and will use each and every one of us, but it's also important for us to make sure that we're ready for when those opportunities come. The final scripture that I have is from Hebrews chapter, nine, uh, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. This is where my thinking on these things began this week because of who we are and what we are and how we do things. And to share something with you, I know there's a pastor this week who has to preach a message, a sermon about whether it's right to, which is the better way to take the offering. At the back of the church, let people put the envelopes in or to take the plates around and which is the right way. And that's his focus in his message to his church this morning because that's where the church's mind is at. I thank God for you all. I, seriously, I count it great blessing that we can go in a little deeper than that, a little less superficial than that, a lot less superficial than that. So, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. That word spur. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Means to stimulate or to provoke, to agitate, to encouragely, pushingly encourage each other. Paul told us that we were created and we are God's workmanship and we are being cultivated to do good works. And here he says, we need to gather, when we gather together, we need to encourage each other about those good works, about doing those good works, about those opportunities by sharing like Tim Tebow did and what does it mean to you and how does God give you the opportunity to do a good work well I want to share a personal example my grandson Hudson I I love him and I care about him and I worry about the world that he grows up in and I want him to be shielded and protected and not have to deal with all the junk that's out there I really do and I just I, I pray for the Lord to give him a simple heart a pure, simple heart, and to keep him simple and naive when it comes to worldly things. Smart, and, but yet simple and naive. 
And there's a song from years ago that I loved by Jeff Moore in the distance. It's called Simple Heart. And I read, I read the words again, simple heart beat in me, a simple heart will set me free. And I had to, I, I copy and pasted the lyrics for that song and I sent an email to Hudson and I sent a copy of the, uh, a link to the YouTube video with Jeff Moore singing that song. And it's a powerful song about how this, how we, when we simplify our hearts and our persons in terms of worldly things, that we can become more effective. And I, I said, this song was important to me when I was growing up, and I pray that this would be something that you would always remember. A good work. It was on my heart, it was in my mind, and I did it. We have, we have wonderful people in this church who send cards and make phone calls and reach out to each other, to other people, and even people who we're not involved with all the time. But remember, each one of us is a poem. Each one of us is a creation of beauty that the Lord is doing a work in, and he has planned for us to do good works in his name as we walk in this world. And we need to purify ourselves so that when the call comes, we are ready to do his will. We are, our mind is not covered with headphones and our heads not focused so intently on that video screen watching that movie that we're unaware of someone passing away two seats behind and the need for us to go and pray. It's a wonderful opportunity to think that God can do that in us through our faith in Him. Remember, these originate from God and we are empowered by Him through our faith to do the good works. You say amen? All right, now may the peace of God, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with every good thing for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.